Well, welcome <laughs> to Bioinformatics, uh, Big Data and Bioinformatics. My name is Dr. Michael Edwards. You can call me, I go by a lot of different things. You can call me pretty much what you want. If you're going to call me Mr. Edwards, I prefer Dr. Edwards instead. Or Dr. E works fine with me as well. Um, and one, one other thing I want to kind of point out right at the beginning is, you know, I'm going to treat you all like adults, you know, until you prove me wrong. And I think just the class works that much better that way. So a lot of what we're going to, you know, the assignments and the work, you're going to get out of it what you put in. And that I'm just there to kind of guide you on your journey. But you got to make that journey yourself. I can't make the steps for you. So, but we're going to have a lot of fun. And the things that I teach you, you can apply from here on out. Who here has worked with Excel very much. The program. A little bit? Okay. How about you? A little bit. Well, by the end of this class, or by the end of, so our first section will be, and I'm going to talk about it's going to be NFL. At the end of this section, you all should be experts at Excel. That's like the peanut butter and jelly of data analysis. This is what, you know, this is the meat and potatoes of, of data analysis. And everybody has an Excel program on their computers. So I'm going to teach you to how to use that to analyze just about any kind of data that you want. And even though I work on science projects, I still use it all the time. Um, okay. So what is data? And why is it important? If you look here, you can see all these pixels up here, right? Little boxes. They don't mean much when you just look at each individual one. But I'm going to tell you right now that on your average big screen TV that you have about 2 million of these pixeled boxes, right? And when you watch TV, do you see all these boxes? No, of course not. Your mind puts these, these data points together. And then basically what you do is it makes a picture. And these pictures can make you laugh, can make you cry, can make you do a lot of different things. But remember, when you're watching TV, you're just watching little boxes. All these emotions, all these things that are coming out are just from a bunch of squares. <laughs> well, they aren't squares depending on how you put them together, the pictures that you make. And so the main point of this class is going to be how do we take all of this data and make pictures, pictures that you can understand, that we can use to get a uh, more in-depth analysis or, or idea of what's going on. Not only that, but we can get an idea of what's going on and what can happen. And that's where the power of this stuff comes, is that all of these pixels, all of this information can be used to predict the future. I swear to you. <laughs> I use it to cure diseases. Information matters. It's something. And it's those people who know how to put it together that are going to go very, very far. And that's going to be kind of the next horizon on, on uh, the science frontier. Who can analyze and interpret data well? All right. So what are some of the ways we use information? Well, does anybody recognize this picture? It's from a movie. Does anybody know this movie? No? Oh, what's that one guy's name? Th this guy. What? What's, what's his name? Well, that's Brad Pitt, I know. And no one cares. Like, I've asked people, like, you don't think Brad Pitt's hot anymore, do you? No. <laughs> when I was young, he, that, that was a heartthrob. But so everybody knows this guy. What's, what's his name? I can't remember. Uh, he's been in a bunch of movies. All right. Anyway, this is the, from the movie Moneyball. And we are going to watch it next week on Wednesday. And it's basically a story of the Oakland A's. And this manager didn't have any money. The owner wasn't going to give him any money to buy players. So he had to use the amount of money he had in the smartest way. So what he did was he got a data analysis, a statistician, to go through the numbers in baseball and pick out the best players for the amount of money that they could buy, buy these players for. He did so well that they actually made it to the World Series that very next day, even though they, they lost like three of their stars the year before. We're going to watch this. Now, and when he was doing it, everybody thought he was crazy. He's like, no, you can't do that. You just got to go and send your scouts out, and they got to watch all these players. But he actually looked at the numbers, and they devised a way to put to, uh, together a team that would win. 
And so we're actually going to, our first chapter is, or our first section of this course is we're going to analyze NFL data. You're going to be amazed how deep and how different American football is going to be when you actually start digging in the numbers. You're going to, some really cool trends are going to come out that not a lot of people know about. So you can use it in sports, and they've been doing this. So now everybody, all the baseball teams has a, has a statistician, football teams. If you're an athletic club, you are analyzing data, and you're going to do some of the similar things that we do. Uh, National Security Agency. Who's here has heard of uh, uh, Edward Snowden? You have? What did he do? What, what did he expose? Yeah, the government. What, were, what was the government doing? Spying on, spying on us. Yes. I got news for you. It isn't just the government that's spying on you. And how they spy on you, they don't even have to listen to your conversations. They just take all the data that's associated with you and use some of these analytical tools that I'm going to teach you, and they can figure out what you're going to do, if you're a terrorist or not, if you're talking to terrorists. They do make mistakes as well. Uh, Facebook, like I said, I guess you guys, does, is anybody on Facebook now? Like all the kids are on different things, right? What are you guys on, Instagram or, yeah. is it Instagram is the cool thing now? <laughs> yeah, Snapchat, whatever. Every time you're on one of those social media networks, the reason is you don't have to pay for them, right? Do you ever wonder why, why you don't have to pay for to use Facebook? They want you to use it. You know why? Because they're mining you, <laughs> just like the government. And instead of trying to figure out if you're a terrorist, they're trying to figure out what you might buy, what you might watch, how to influence that. Every time, you, you've probably seen those, those polls like, which you know, Lord of the Rings character are you most like? Or you know, Backstreet, not Backstreet Boy. Who's, what's the new group, One Dimension? Or <laughs> I don't know, one of those. <laughs> But every time you take one of those polls and you answer their questions, they are mining your data. And they're using that information to figure you out, to sell you stuff. So again, Facebook uses, everybody's using information. Does anybody recognize this guy? His name is Nate Silver. Anybody hear of him? Probably not. This guy right here, he predicted all the major elections in 2012. And it blew everybody away. If you were to talk to Republicans, they thought Mitt Romney was going to win the election, right? You guys remember that? Remember Mitt Romney? You're like, ugh, yeah. <laughs> well, he figured it out. So all the Republicans thought they were going to win the election. But he mined all – he didn't pull anybody. He didn't ask anybody who they were going to vote for. What he did was basically take all the polls that were out there, you know, some lean left, some lean right. He took the average of all of those and got – pretty much the exact results of the election. Now everybody's doing this. Part of our chapter, and in one of the chapters, we're going to do the wisdom of crowd experiment, and we're actually going to replicate this, and it's going to be really cool. All right, and obviously, you know, money, right? Everybody wants to make money. The way you make money is by mining information. That the people that make the most money in the stock market are the ones that have the most analytical tools that are analyzing the market. And farming. Who would have thought that farming is all big data? So I just got back from, uh, do you all have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah. Eat a lot of food? I did. I probably gained about 10 pounds. <laughs> well, anyway, we were at, I was in uh, Nebraska, Imperial Nebraska, at my, uh, my uncle's farm. That's where we ate. His computer set up for his, uh, for his wheat farm and his, his uh, cornfields are much more sophisticated than my setup. With climate change and you know variable precipitation rates, he basically has GPS to his entire farm. He told me that there's some points where he could probably get off his tractor and the tractor would drive itself. All based on data mining. And again, you can see how all of this stuff, all of this data mining, how it can be used in practical life. So what I'm teaching you today or what I'm going to teach you this year, don't think of it just as, you know, this is a way to analyze NFL data. 
when we, when we go through it and we talk about the analysis, <coughs> basically, these are going to be tools that you can use for anything. And people do. You can use it to make money. You can use it to grow food. You can use it to spy on people. Please don't do that. <laughs> That's my worst nightmare. I teach you this, and then you work for the NSA. <laughs> and then you spy on me. So basically what I'm telling you is that there's, there's a lots and lots of tools that we can use. All right. So our first chapter, and what we're going to do, I wish I could make this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. So in our first chapter, what we're going to do is we're going to analyze the NFL, right? There's a lot of data in the NFL, right? And there's a lot of money to be made in the NFL as well. Lots of things associated with it. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to mine all this data. And we're going to see if we can predict who's going to win and who's going to lose. Who's going to score the most points? Who's going to score the least points? These are all relevant things that we can learn through the data. And the key is, and what we're eventually what we're going to do maybe next week is we're going to try to predict who's going to win next week. Yeah? How do you do that with like There, those are called variables, and we will talk about that, how you can incorporate variables into your model. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off very simple. We're just going to look at scores, right? And, and we're going to talk about that. Teams give points up and they take away points. How do we use that information to figure out who might win and who might lose? But you're absolutely right. That's a good point is they are always variables. No matter how perfectly you model the system, there will always be some variable in real life that could potentially mess you up, right? If I think, uh, you, know, you know, New England's going to win next week and then Tom Brady, uh, Tom Brady slips on a banana peel and, you know, breaks his arm, you know, that affects my model. Now, that, now that's no longer true, like whatever I predicted. So you can only go on what facts that you, you have, and that's a good point. So hopefully, like I said, we're going to watch um, – Next week, we're going to watch Moneyball, which I think is a great, great movie. And I will, you know, it does have some profanity in it. I'm going to warn you right now. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> so, and then here, what I'm going to try to do, and I think I can get this, is I'm going to have somebody from the Rockies come in and talk to us. And these are, this is somebody from the Rockies who, who actually does this data analysis and who helps pick out the players. So hopefully he can give you an idea of what he, some of the tools that he uses. And I think this will be a great talk. After we get done with that, so that's going to be in December. Okay, we're going to do this all December. When you guys come back from break, then we're going to start looking at how do we take information that's around us to understand our own community. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're going to look at some of the information associated with Green Valley Ranch, right? We can ask questions. You know, what does Green Valley Ranch compare to other areas? What's the, you know, what's the education rate? the racial makeup, right? A question that I think that we should look at, and we could talk about this, but what I, you know, obviously a, a big thing happened when we legalized marijuana in this, this state. Did that have any effect on the crime rate? You know, you have arguments for and against, right? That, oh, if you legalize, you know, crime is going to increase dramatically. Well, let's take a look and see what really happened. So, and for this at somewhere in January, I'll have a crime analyst from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation as our guest speaker. And that'll be really cool. So this is how they use information to catch criminals. So I think this would be a really good talk. And my sister, she is actually, uh, she works for the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. So this should be a slam dunk getting this speaker. Better, or I'll, uh, I'll haunt her. All right, let's talk about, so our, our first thing that we're going to look at is analyzing NFL data. This is our first project. Who here likes football? <laughs> a little bit? Hey, was somebody in the back? Not so much? That's okay. Again, we're just using football as kind of a template to explore these different ways to analyze data, right? And you can think of this as companies, right? That, uh, you know, some of these football teams, you know, they score points and that they're also measured by how many they give away. Think of companies, profits, losses, same thing. 
So everything you learn with this football algorithm isn't just applied to sports, but it can be applied to real life, to, say, the stock market as well. So think of it that way as any more now. You know, I used to be a huge football fan. I don't even watch the games. I'm just interested in more in the data. Although I did watch last night's game. Did anybody watch last night? Yeah. Yeah, I should have Brock Osweiler up here instead of Peyton Manning. <laughs> Do you think he's gonna coming back next year? Manning? Yeah. Probably, but he's probably going to I don't know. I, don't think, I think he's going to move teams. I think he's done. So, again, you know, you can understand how if you're a, uh, you know, you own a team, how important it is to know if you're, the players you're drafting are good, right? There's also a huge industry associated with football, especially the NFL. Who's heard of that fantasy sports leagues now? The ones that do, they do it like every week. DraftKings, what's the other one? Uh, uh, there's DraftKings, and what was, what's the other like major one? Yeah, uh, there's another one I can't remember. Any idea? Yeah. No. But, so these are games. So through a loophole, people can bet they can take players and basically use this to, you know, to make money. Here's what you should learn, or what you should know, is that just 1.3 percent of all these people playing these daily sports are actually making 91 percent of the profits. What do you think this 1.3 percent are doing? Yeah, do you think they're just sitting there throwing darts at a board or going, oh, I like that guy, he's got a good haircut. Maybe I vote for, you know, maybe I put him on my roster. Heck no. They are mining the heck out of that data, right? Again, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to mine this data. How do the work? Uh, you basically pick players, different offensive players, and based on their performance, it gives them... Uh, do you have to draft them, like, for the whole season? No, just for the weekend. Just for that weekend? Yeah. And by the way, I'm going to tell you right now, I do not, I'm not promoting gambling to you at all, <laughs> just for legal reasons, I'm going to say that. But I'm just saying that you can use this to make money. <laughs> Some people can use it to make money. You can't because you're not 18. Who's 18 here? Okay, you can use it then. <laughs> I think it is. Maybe it's 21, I don't know. If it's not 21, you shouldn't gamble. But again, remember, you know, there's a, this is a billion-dollar industry associated with this fantasy sports stuff. There's a trillion-dollar industry associated with uh, the stock market. Same tools, same ideas. How do I predict whether the stock's going to go up? How am I going to predict whether this team's going to win or not? Same, same, you know, techniques. All right, let's talk about football. So really... Football teams are two sides of the same coin, right? That it's not really one team. Even though it's one team, there's really two different aspects of the team, right? There's the offense, presented with John Elway here, right? So you have one part of the team that their job is to score points, right? What's the other part of what's the other team doing? Trying to prevent the other team from scoring points, right? So as we model these, what I'm going to kind of tell you, talk about, is the way that these two things work. And we have to model them separately. That you, can a, a team have a really good offense and a bad defense? Totally. Absolutely. So what we're going to have to do is figure out, how do we figure this out? How do we tell if the offense is good or the defense is good, bad, whatever? And the way we're going to do that is we collect data. And the nice thing, what we're going to do is we're going to start off with each of these teams. So each of these teams are going to have two different values. And I'm going to give you a link so you can download this Excel spreadsheet. I know you three were in the, the, bot, the intro class, right? Yeah. yeah. So you're familiar with this. You've done this, started this a little bit. So this is kind of new for you. So we did this in the intro class. Is Basically what we did was is we took averages. We figured out what's the distribution of say how much this team gives up and how much this, this team scores. So in week one, the offense scored 18 points and the defense allowed the other team to score 17. You can see how if we model this week to week, we can kind of see trends. 
And as we talk about this, we're going to talk about statistics. Who here is, knows much about statistics? Any, any statistical terms are you guys aware of? Mean, median, mode. Mean, median, mode. Sweet. So you guys have done that range, standard deviation. Ah, oh, sweet. I love this school. <laughs> yes. That's exactly what we're going to do is that, say, how many did the Broncos score last night? What was it? 30, 32, 31 maybe? Was it 31? Right. Do the Broncos score 30 every time? No, of course not, right? Sometimes they'll score more, sometimes they'll score less. What happens is there's a mean in here somewhere and that their scores are kind of a distribution. And this is called uh, the bell curve. Anybody hear of a bell curve before? Yeah? Looks like a bell, doesn't it? So you would expect most of, the, most of their scores are going to be around this mean. Sometimes they'll score a lot, a lot of points, and sometimes they probably won't score very, very much at all. But again, it's this distribution. And what we're going to do is I'm going to teach you is how do we use this distribution to kind of figure out, you know, what the team's going to do that we know there's variability in, in the way they play, how can we model that to kind of figure out, you know, if they're gonna score a lot or not score very much the next week. Now this is kind of where we get into statistics. Do you think, and this is what we found, so we've done this last year, we analyzed the NFL data, and guess what, this is probably not gonna to come to a surprise to you, but all these NFL teams play a little differently if they're playing at home and away, yeah. right? Do you think they always play better at home? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. That's what killed me. When I first started doing this, some teams actually play statistically better away than they do actually at home. The Dallas offense plays better away than they do at home. And you wouldn't expect that. So why, why, why might they play better away? What do you think could be the... Could be pressure, yeah. Probably not the fans. What about the stadium? Don't they play in that, they play in that giant billion-dollar stadium with that big screen on the top? I bet you got heard of... What is that called? Uh, oh, what's the stadium called? Cowboys Stadium or I don't know. It's just a monster stadium. Well, anyway, they made this monster stadium, but I don't think it's very conducive to offensive scoring in there. So it might not just be them, but it might be every offensive team that plays there might play worse. Well, that, that scoreboard at the top, uh, I think it, you can't kick it as far because it'll hit the top of that thing. <laughs> Did you guys hear about that? Yeah. Some of the punters were having issues because they kick it up to kick it to the other team, and if they kicked it too high, it would hit the scoreboard. So maybe that might be part of it. But I get again, that's that's the thing where we'll use the data analysis is we'll we'll try to figure out using the data why that might be occurring. So that might be something we might look into. But I will tell you that for the most part, most teams play better at home, and through some other data analysis, they kind of believe it's the refs. And they don't do it on purpose, the refs. It's just that they're kind of influenced by the home crowd. That subconsciously, they kind of want of their approval. So a lot of the calls are going to go more towards the home team than the, the away team. And then away, obviously, some places are really tough to play, right? Yeah. The Black Hall, you're, are you a Raiders fan? Yeah. All right, get out right now. <laughs> Well, they're not very good this year, so I'm, I'm not going to, like, hound you for that either. But, you know, there can be huge advantages. So how do we tell which teams play better home and away? And what we're eventually going to look at, what time does this class get over with? Was it 1? 2.10. Two ten. Yeah. Okay, we got some time. So what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about statistical tests. Who here has heard of the T-test? Have you heard of the T-test? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody in the back? <laughs> Dr. B has. This is what we're going to do is, and what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you the story about how the T-test started. And it actually started through Guinness Brewery. Who's here have heard of Guinness Brewery? Guinness Beer. 
Anybody? You guys haven't had any. I hope yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, yeah. I was a kid too, so. But actually, this was developed in the early 1900s by this guy, William, Wa or William Gossett. And he was kind of slumming. He was working for the brewery, and the brewery wanted to know whether the beer tasted worse the farther they shipped it. So for the longest time, Guinness wouldn't ship their beer farther than like 60 miles away from Dublin. This is where it started in Ireland. So they basically got him to say, you know, you can imagine people were screaming like, you know, give us beer. <laughs> this is Irish we're talking about, you know. I'm Irish, so I can say that. You know, give us beer, please. So they wanted to make sure that the beer tasted the same so it wouldn't like, so their brand wouldn't be, you know, if, it, if they shipped it far, it would taste bad and they would get a bad name. So they hired this guy to develop this test. And he kind of uses those bell curves and determines whether these two hills are far enough apart to be actually different or the same. So we're going to talk about the t-test because that's, that's another bread and butter thing about statistics. And we'll definitely be using that a lot. You can see how that will work. Is that some of these teams play very, very differently, either home or away. This is, a, this is called the jump program. And eventually I'm going to let you guys use this program to make your own graphs. But you can see, here are the averages. This is the defense and the offense. This is if they, if they scored higher than this, or if they're positive score, that means they scored more than they expected. Here will be, they scored less than expected. Offense the same way. So if the defense allowed more, more, more points, this would, be this would be a worse result. And you can see some of these home away and averages that you can kind of get an idea of some of these teams. That's the team that has all three above the, the offense, above this zero line is Arizona. Is Arizona good? Yeah. yeah. What other teams have three above? Let's see. New Orleans, their defense is terrible, but their offense is good, at least till this last week. Kansas City, New England's up here, right there. Yeah. Some of the good defenses would be Kansas City looks good. Pittsburgh? Yeah, I think so. But again, what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to, I'm basically going to teach you how do we determine whether there's a home and away effect? And if so, how much should we add to the score? Okay. What's your um, percentage for like right and wrong? Like, what's in time like you get it right or wrong, like in prediction? Um, I would say for my predictions, I'm about. For the NFL, about 80% maybe. Yeah. Which is actually, if you look at some of the experts out there, that's better than they are doing. So I've been doing this the whole year. So <laughs> I still haven't won my pool yet, but I'm trying. <laughs> so what other information, you know, besides score, right? There's other information. What, what other information do you think would affect this, uh, a, the way a, a team might, might play? And you mentioned injuries, injuries, injuries right? You know, if, you know who, who's actually playing. But there's other information, too. Like, what other va factors might affect the game? Weather. Weather. Ooh, that was a good one. I didn't even think about that one. Turnovers, right? Sacks. What you're going to find is when the prediction falls apart, we're going to be able to figure out why it did that. And that's the most important thing about math, is you won't get every – don't expect that – the t things I teach you, you're going to be able to predict real life exactly. But when you don't, what you can do is you can figure out what you did wrong, and then you can correct for that. The main goal is see the pattern. I see that this team's doing this. I think it's going to go down here. Therefore, they might lose. This one's going up. This might, this might be that they win. So again, we're going to be doing this all December. So on Wednesday, we're just basically, I'm going to give you a spreadsheet, and we're just going to go to town and just start playing with the numbers. Other part of the class, again, that the second part is understand your community. You know, racial makeup, income. What other information do you, about your community do you think would give you a better understanding of it? Housing rates, right? How, how affordable is it to live here? What does that compare to other areas? How much does your schools get? 
These are all important questions that you might not think are important, but they will be. If you understand this information, you will understand your community, you will understand your surroundings much, much better. And again, the crime data, that's what I want to really stress to you guys is all this information is out there, and we can get it. And again, once we get the information, then we can ask questions. Did the legalization of marijuana have any effect on the crime rate in Colorado? We can ask that question. Okay, then after, in February, we're going to do the Wisdom of Crowd study. Uh, do you guys remember last year when we were running around with a rock and you had to guess the weight of the rock? Yeah? yeah. yeah? We're going to do something similar, but we're not going to do the rock anymore. <laughs> the rock was tough. <laughs> I actually guessed it. What's that? I actually guessed it. Did you? Did you do 128? 128? Yeah, it was 128 pounds. What would you guess? I guess like 135. Maybe. You were closer than most students, that's for sure. Well, that's what we found was is that when we did this, again, this is a wisdom or crowd thing, is that when we did this, there was a huge age effect. So the older you are, the more accurate your guess got. There was also a gender effect that given this rock it was heavy, the boys seemed to answer it a little better than the women did. Not only that, but if the women touched the rock before they made their guess, their, their guess was actually worse. And I'll show you the graph that shows this. It's way cool. So what we're going to do instead of doing that is we're going to guess the amount of balls in a, in a container. I think will be a more fair. We'll see if those trends still show up. Because I think actually... I have a feeling the women are a lot smarter as far as this guest than the men are for this one. But again, I'll have a guy. This is, a, this is a, one of my uh, colleagues, Dr. Jim Costello. He's an expert in uh, bioinformatics, and he'll give a talk on crowd theory and uh, dream, uh, this dream challenge that he do. Uh, he'll, he'll explain it, but it's really, really cool. It's getting lots of people to work on one problem. And then after February, for the rest of the time, we're going to work on bioinformatics. And there's lots and lots of data. We are not, I'm not going to make up like, you know, special data sets for you. You're going to work on actual scientific data sets. And the things that you learn, probably no one else will know besides you. That is the coolest thing about working in science and this stuff is that when I analyze a project, some of the first information that comes off that, I'm the only person in the entire world that knows that. You know, we've explored everything. We went to the bottom of the sea. We've been to the moon. You know, we've been to just about every place on this planet. You know, that's the new, you know, exploring is, is knowledge. Who knows the knowledge first? And I will give you the tools to, to know knowledge before all these other people. So, again, we'll do the wisdom of crowd thing, and I'll explain. I'm kind of running out of time, or I would explain about the cow. But it was a really cool experiment. Basically, if you take a lot of people's guesses, maybe no one gets the right answer for the ox, so they will guess how much this ox weighs. But if you take the average, it's the exact weight of the ox. And people have been replicating this for, since for 100 years. Yeah. All right, I'm going to explain it. So this guy went to this fair, right? And they had this contest. They were auctioning off a bull. And whoever got the weight of the bull got all the meat from the bull. And back in the early 1900s, that was a big thing, right? <laughs> that wasn't, so you could tell people were like trying to answer this very correctly. So this guy, Francis Galton, he had this theory. He was his father of eugenics, which I'll explain to you later. It's, it's kind of a crack science. But um, he thought that the experts were much better than the population, right? So he asked his experts how much the bull weighs. What he found was no one got the weight of the bull, but when he took everybody's guesses, 800 people's guesses, it was the exact weight of the bull. When he took all the experts and took their guess, it wasn't as close as all the common people. So basically, the more guesses you, if you frame your question right, you can ask lots of people and get the right answer. And I will tell you, the CIA is using this stuff now, too. This wisdom of crowd thing is big. So... So we're going to talk about that. We're going to develop our own study. Again, we're going to go through the school and we're going to terrorize them just like we did last year. <laughs> and it gets everybody kind of pumped up too. I like it as well. So we'll ask all the students here, you know, is there any, you know, how much, how many balls in a container? You know, and like I said, last year, there was a huge age effect. 
You can see the seventh graders, they were crazy. I couldn't believe what they were guessing. But you could see this kind of, it's not perfect, but you could see it go down and down. And by the time you got to the teachers, it was pretty dang close, their guess. Right? I know. <laughs> we're going to see if that comes through. Maybe this is just something having to do with a rock. I don't know. But we're going to test it again this year. Again, the males were slightly better. And then if you touched the rock, unless you were a female, you can see the females here. These are the females that didn't touch the rock. These are the ones that did. This zero represents a perfect guess. So you can see that if the females, the younger females, if they touched the rock, it made their, their guess more inaccurate. Males didn't have much effect except the seventh graders. I, seventh graders are weird. I don't know. But again, we're going to use this. And, and basically, I didn't make this graph. The students from last year did. So we investigated this all. And we actually we submitted our study to a national meeting and got accepted. But we couldn't go because we have no money. But I thought it was pretty cool. We got accepted to go to a meeting in San Diego. Yeah, it was a statistical meeting. So we sent in an abstract. Uh, Mario, you remember Mario? He wrote it. They were like, oh, this is great. We we're like, do you have any scholarships? And they're like, nope. <laughs> it's like, okay. Here's the deal is if we do a good enough job and we have good enough data, maybe we write a paper. Who wants to be on a science paper? Okay, yeah. <laughs> it is cool. Everybody wants to be on a science paper. What's funny, what's great is, you know, I've been on a lot of papers. You know, once you're on a paper, you're there forever. Somebody 100 years from now can look you up and find out what you did. And I think that's way, way cool. So we're going to shoot for that. If we can't get it with our, our Wisdom of Crowd study, maybe we do it with uh, the bioinformatics stuff. But I'm going to try to get you guys published. We'll see what we can do. And again, we're not going to do the, the weight of the rock. What we're going to do is how many items in a jar, I think. But I'm going to get a big container so people can see it. I think this would be cool. And again, bioinformatics. This is what we're going to, this is going to be the last part of the class. So there's lots and lots of biological information out there. Where does all this information come from? Okay. Now, I know you guys, you know, I always brag about your school. Is everybody familiar with gene expression? Do you know how DNA does anything in your body? Yeah. Right? It's your brains, right? So how does, it do, how does it do anything in your cells? Ah! <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you. So the DNA, it stays in your nucleus, right? Everybody knows what a nucleus is, right? Right? So it makes a copy of itself. It's one of its genes, right? If I, uh, if I was celebrating one of my buddies getting married and we went to the bachelor party, I drank too much alcohol... My gene for alcohol dehydrogenase, the gene that breaks that down, would be on fire. It would be producing a lot in RNA. And there's 25,000 different genes to produce RNA. This RNA can be translated. Anybody heard of the ribosomes? Ribosomes in your cell? Sarda is all coming back. Little flashbacks. Everybody's like, ah, biology, what? <laughs> well, what happens is your, your ribosomes read this RNA and then they make proteins. And it's the proteins that do everything in your body. It breaks down the alcohol, it builds your muscles, it produces enzymes that drive just about every major biological chemical reaction in your body. If you didn't have enzymes, basically proteins, nothing would get done in your body. And you would all die. We'd all fall apart like, pfft, done. But your body makes these proteins that makes these things go. And that's how your DNA does this. Again, there's 500,000 different proteins. Not only that, but we have these microRNAs. There's about 900 of those. And they can actually destroy the RNA. So there's another form of regulation. This RNA can be spliced in many different forms. So I work on this RNA that has 14 different versions of itself. And they all do kind of different things. Proteins, proteins are a mess, and you can phosphor it. They're like having like a, a car, right? And you can soup it up any way you want. You know, you can put headers on it. You can, you know, dual exhaust, whatever you want. Your body does the same thing to these proteins. 
you can have millions of different variations of proteins. Let's go back to the RNA, the DNA. So if I took the DNA out of one of your cells and stretched it out lengthwise, it would be taller than I am, right? What your body does in order for it to fit in those, your tiny cells is compact it. And the way it's compacted depends on what genes get fired on and what, are, what aren't. It compacts it around these histones, and they can be methylated. And in fact, if you look at these two insects here, one's a locust, one's a grasshopper. Grasshopper, if you're riding your bike, might fly up in your face and bother you, right? Locusts can travel thousands of miles and destroy whole communities, eating all their crops. Genetically, these are exactly the same. It's just the way their DNA is compacted determines whether you're a locust or you're a grasshopper. And I'm going to tell you right now, we can measure all of this stuff. People, we, technology, can measure all of this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of this, this information. We're going to figure out what's going on in biology. That's the goal. And why would we do that? Because there's an almost unlimited amount of biological data. And it's free. I don't know about you, but I love free. <laughs> Anybody like free? I love free. And that's why I love, and that's why I love being a bioinformatician, is I can investigate anything I want, pretty much, because all that information is out there. That most of the research done in this country is funded by the government. And if you're funded by the government, you have to make your data available to everybody. I take advantage of that. I take their data, and then I analyze it. And I do it better than they do. <laughs> and they paid for it. But this is what we're doing. And we're going to talk about, you know, as we analyze these things, we're going to talk about personalized medicine. We're going to talk about your own DNA. Who would love to? So I'm going to go to a conference this summer, and I have to send them a DNA sample. And what they're going to do is sequence my DNA, and then we're going to analyze. I'm going to analyze my own DNA at this conference. How cool is that? Your DNA tells you where you came from. It'll tell you the countries that you came from. It'll tell you what organisms you evolved from. It'll tell you who you are now, hair color, uh, you know, personal, you know, how tall you probably are. And the crazy thing is, is it'll tell you what happens to you in the future. Will you get a disease later on in life? Who wants to know that information? I know, I'm kind of the same way too. Some people are like, I don't want to know, you know? Here's what's going to happen is everybody in this room is going to have their DNA sequence probably in five to ten years. It's gotten so cheap that we can do that. But here's the deal is only maybe 0.001% of the population is going to be able to understand that information. I'm going to give you the tools to be in that 0.001%. And again, right now there's like, this is the most popular biological data set out or repository. And this is actually low. There's almost 2 million samples in this database. This is where we're going to get all our information. And like I said, it's almost unlimited. And last year we worked on lung cancer, which is very important. This is a lung tumor. Um, it's got one of the worst five-year survival rates of any cancers. That when you get it, you don't know it. Like if you get a melanoma, you can see it. You get a lump in your, in your lungs, you don't know. So there's a big deal is how can we tell if somebody has cancer before they even know it? Through a blood sample, right? And so last year we did this and the students analyzed this. I did not do this. This is one of the students using a software pro program called Ingenuity Pathway Analysis. If you were going to use this on your own, it would cost you $10,000 a year. You are going to be able to use this software for free. And in fact, the software that I'm going to give you that you're going to use this year if you were going to buy it on your own, it would probably end up costing you $50,000 a year. And you're going to use this for free. And you're going to find things like this. You're going to find these signaling networks that play roles in disease. I haven't decided on a project yet, but we'll, we'll discuss it. Again, we can work on anything we want. Anything. DNA, gene expression, proteins, whatever. All the tools kind of work the same. And that's kind of what I, you know, this is just the journey, right? The farther you enter the truth, the deeper it is. That I'm going to give you these tools, and you're going to go swimming, and you're going to end up in deep water. Don't, don't get, you know, don't, don't be afraid. 
you know, and that's kind of why I do this class to, to this is like, you don't know yet to be afraid that I give these to graduate students. People with PhDs are scared to death about data, right? I don't understand this too much information. Uh, you don't know yet to be scared. <laughs> so I'm going to give you the tools to learn how to swim and you can swim anywhere you want. And I guarantee you the skills that you learn here, you can apply to just about anything. All right, so here is where to reach me, okay? Uh, I want you to write down my, my email uh, address. Can you send me an email sometime today? Or, e or actually, if you could do that now, that would be cool as well. MichaelEdwardsBioInfo at gmail.com. Okay. We will also have our Google pages, and I'm going to give you these links here. Remember, this is going to be recorded so you can go back and look this up. I have a Facebook page, and I'm also on Spotify as well. Um, I'm going to warn you, some of the lyrics are adult, but all the beats are legit. So, uh, What's that? Just, just send it to me. Just say, hey, this is me. Or just go, hi. All I need to know is, is that... I need your email so I can send you stuff. Here's our assignment. I got two minutes, right? <laughs> uh, we actually blasted it at 210. Okay. The next one runs 250 to All right, it's coming. I'm sorry, guys. Here's your, your assignment for Wednesday. Go to this Google Plus site, GVR Big Data 2015 to 16. Okay, I'll send you this as well today, okay? Yeah, that's fine. But what you're going to do is download the data set, and we'll go from there. All right. Thanks, Dr. Hey, no worries.